This is Don DeNoon, writer of number 111, Lippitt Seafood Company. You're listening to The Blacklist Exposed on Golden Spiral Media. It's great to be back and finally out of that sticky wicket of a hiatus. Welcome to The Blacklist Exposed. I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson, and I also am no longer a person of interest. At least that's what Troy kept telling me over the break. Thanks for joining us once again, and Happy New Year to all of you. We are here to discuss number 111 on the blacklist, Lippitt Seafood Company, which aired January 5th, 2017. The teleplay was written by Don DeNoon and directed by Don Thorin. Show notes and other intel for this episode of The Blacklist Exposed can be found at theblacklistexposed.com. Quick bits of business before we get into the swing of things here, before we kick it off. Number one, we hope you all had a fantastic holiday, whatever it is that you celebrate. And we're pretty glad that you guys came back to listen to us and enjoy us arguing, having hand-to-hand combat about the blacklist. So if you are a longtime listener, thank you so much for coming back to the show. Yes, and if you're new to the show because of the season four fall finale, which was huge. Then meet Troy. He's often wrong. Yes, uh, <laughs> you are in for a treat. Since we don't do our TV podcast in a recap style, we definitely go much deeper into the characters and their motives. So buckle up. It'll be fun. For the rest of you that are just on this ride to see how badly Troy crashes with his mother theory, I like you people. We can be friends. And if you're looking for some more Blacklist in your life, then be sure to check out the latest Blacklist novel now on sale. Pick up number 159 on the Blacklist, The Beekeeper. It's not officially canon to the show, but it is a pretty good story and a creepy blacklister, so definitely check it out. There's a lot of buzz around that one. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? What? You have no idea. Uh, now, before we can have all of you eat seafood, we asked you way back in November to answer the profiling question of the week, which was, what did Ray have all you to eat seafood? I don't yeah. even know what that meant, but okay. Before we could have uh, our lobster. The, <laughs> the question was, what did Red whisper to Kirk? Was it... Uh, What's up, baby? Was it something like that? Was it, I'm your daddy? What was it? Priscilla Lyman, she said, Katerina is alive, that or I am Katerina. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tori said, these violent delights have violent ends. (laughs) I see (laughs) See what you you did there. Did there. (laughs) Hey, I hear Beyond Westworld is a pretty cool podcast, too. Neil Ottenstein, he told him the information about Katerina that was in that podcast. Pactobia Rostova envelope from the episode Lady Ambrosia. And he's just uh-huh. saying it as it's written. He knows Pactoba is really Rostova in Russian. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rory said, I always like DC Comics better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that makes me laugh. I make, I did not read any of these <laughs> before we started doing the show, so these are, these are new to me. Uh, Tiffany Chestnut, Rosebud. That's funny. I hear it's a sled. Just kidding. He told Kirk... Who's Liz's actual father was? A career criminal and agent known to both of them. Kirk realized the truth when he heard it and why there was so much mystery shrouding it all this time. That's why he pulled up stakes and left town. If Red were Katarina, or Red knew where Katarina was, then Kirk probably would have stayed close to be able to get more closure. I like you, Tiffany. I like you a lot. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Gabriel Light said that, uh, hey, you got bad breath. I think that gets you killed, Gabriel. (laughs) That really does. Tanya uh, Kostenko said, it's me, my little cabbage, in, in Russian, of course. <laughs> what? You're not going to do what? it? You're not going to do any uh, accents this year, Aaron? Is that the deal? You, you swore it off as your New Year's uh, resolution? It's me, my little cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> Linda Smith said. I don't know if that was Russian. But uh, that'd be something. close. Uh, Linda Smith said, your flies unzipped. Wee wee. And Garvin. But I'm not going to try it. Elizabeth is not Masha, but I can tell you where Masha is. Oh, I like that one. David said, I have M&Ms in my pocket. Gross. All right. Ben, ben Perriman, uh, maybe a secret ingredient to the best cheeseburger chowder. Cheese- I, that does sound, at first I was like, that sounds gross. And then as the episode went on, I'm like, you know what? Now I kind of want some cheeseburger chowder. Someone actually put a recipe up for the cheeseburger chowder in the Facebook group. So make sure you go check that out if you're interested. Is it really? It is. Oh, sweet. We're like Pinterest now? Yeah. <laughs> Love <laughs> Excellent. it. Excellent. Stuff for the new year. We're going all kinds of fun. And Rachel Towns said, which I really like kind of interestingly here, said, let's go for the long shot. You remember Katarina because she was your daughter and Masha was your wife. 
His memories have been tampered with, just like Liz's. Ooh. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> that was my mind. So Katarina is Katarina, but Katarina's name is Masha, I think is what she's getting. That's kind of interesting. I like that. Yeah, that's okay. That's a stretch, isn't it? It is. It's different. Yeah, it's there's just a time machine. It's timeless. Did NBC merge the two shows somehow? <laughs> They're both made by Sony. That's true. It's possible. Oh, thanks as always for the great responses. What great question should we start out the mid season with here, Aaron? Uh, this is Troy's question. Troy's question. How will Liz thank Red for the pardon? I know. It's going to be interesting because, remember, this is the man she's been trying to run away from for an entire season here. And now she's back in his clutches once again. What is What shit is Red going to collect from Liz? It'll be interesting. Is it really a debt, though? It's not really a debt because he put her in that spot to begin with. She's the one that pulled the trigger to kill the AG. Red didn't put her in that spot. Uh, he kind of put the pieces in place that got her to that spot. Yeah, maybe. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. All right. With that, let's set out to prove that Aaron is definitely a moron as we discuss this week's case profile. I just want to point out, he he pulled the first shot. Okay? He called me a moron. So when I call him a dum-dum... That's on him. Uh, what do you think, Troy? Let's start this off, because what are your thoughts on our mid-season return before we get into the actual episode? Oh, you put me on the spot first. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. I'm not going to do it first. Go, daddy-o. It, we've been off for like eight weeks, and so my first impression is is when you come back, especially when you had NBC doing the, the football thing on Thursday night, which we know Thursday Night Football has had some kind of, I guess scrutiny against it people are saying that it's a little bit oversaturated so maybe not many as people were watching thursday night football but it seemed like for the eight weeks there wasn't a lot of promotion around the show to get people excited about the thursday night lineup returning and the ratings kind of reflected that in this first week i was expecting a little bit bigger of an episode coming off of that break to get people like hyped up and excited and set the table and especially such a such a big episode that was right exactly and I think this one just, it, it fell a little flat for me, to be quite honest. I mean, it was it was interesting. I liked the Mossad angle. I always love when you get different organizations working together in order to solve a bigger threat from another potential organization that most Americans may not know about. I didn't even know what the initial stood for. Uh, and I don't even think they said the name of the organization in the episode, to be quite honest. Uh, at least I don't remember them saying it. And because of that, I felt this was, I felt it was confusing at first. Like I was trying, who's who and who's working for where and why is there this organ, this um, this company the was it Blackburn, uh, the uh, the uh, company that was making the chips or whatever the satellite stuff. Black Blackthorn. Blackthorn. Kincaid. Blackthorn. That's it. And it, it just to me it was all over the map, and there were just some TV things that were the, like oh it's TV so therefore you can make it happen and <laughs> yeah I'm gonna have a couple of those. It, so I, I guess I disappointed i think is my is where i'm at but i did watch it a second time and i think now that i kind of knew what was going on the episode was much more enjoyable the second time but that's the problem i don't think people watch it twice like maybe some of the diehard fans do i know we do kind of podcast obligation kind of thing but yeah a lot of people said the second time it was better but i think that's a problem if you have to watch it twice yeah okay so here's where where I am. I, I call this a, a foreshadowing episode because everything in the first 15 minutes is kind of foreshadowing for the next 30 minutes. And by the end of the episode, it sets up the rest of the season, or it seems to. That's what I got out of it. I, <laughs> what I was telling Troy is, or he's like, well, what'd you, what'd you think about it? And he was very adamant not to tell me anything about it. Cause I actually saw it a, a day later. I thought it was okay. I mean, it wasn't really good. It wasn't great. It wasn't bad. It was just okay. I mean, sometimes episodes are just okay. And I do agree that when you're coming, it was coming off the break. I think that's probably why it felt disappointing. I think if it would have happened right after the last episode, it wouldn't have mattered at all. It would have just been, you know, another episode, but because it was such a long break, you kind of came back and you expected a bunch of fireworks and, um, excitement and maybe some, some new story threads that, are, that are deeper in the mythology or something like that. But we didn't get much of that. And it feels weird because you say foreshadowing, and I almost felt it was almost like a closure. 
it was okay we have liz and she's not an agent so how do we get her to become an agent again so we can get back to the blacklist of season one maybe we had uh, senator diaz now president-elect diaz when did that happen um that kind of was timeline fast forwarding a little bit but that was kind time, of a, time flies he goes from president-elect to president pretty quick too yeah so and, and, and that that's a confusing part for me and we'll get to that in a bit but <laughs> it seemed like it was like we're trying to put a bow on all these hanging chads and now we can move forward in the next episode. So maybe the next episode is really the comeback one. Well, and, and to add to your earlier point, I watched it a second time because we always do. And I, I really enjoyed it a lot more. Like I would say it's good now. Now, is that because a lot of the threads were, there were a lot of, a lot of things at play and there is a lot of setup for the season. Possibly. Uh, I think maybe things were a little clearer. Maybe, I, but I also wasn't as focused on where's the story from the last the season cliffhanger going to go. You know, I didn't have that in my head anymore. So maybe that was part of it. Maybe it's an expectation thing. I did enjoy it a lot more the second time, and especially the the Aram and Samar storyline. I thought that was handled very well, except for some <laughs> ridiculousness that's uh, TV related that we'll get to. But yeah, so overall, now that I've seen it a second time and I've had time to ingest it and really absorb what's going on, I enjoyed it more. Uh, I definitely don't think it's like a highlight of the season or anything, but I think it's setting pieces in play for for the the final. Well, not the final because they've got another break in between, right? Yeah, there'll be seven episodes here in this batch, and then there'll be six to finish out the season when it comes back in April. Right, right. Okay, so... But I did enjoy it, and it's still still Blacklist, man. There's a lot of things on TV that I would much rather not be watching. That's for sure. Blacklist is a show I would always I always enjoy. And Red was enjoyable as always. He was back in his kind of funny, characteristic self. I actually thought Red was a minor point this week. It was very little screen time for for Reddington this week. You know, but he did have a pretty huge episode last time. So let's get into the episode. Let's. We're already talking around it. Might as well talk about it. You sure. Know? Why not? Well, apparently you could smuggle stuff in a fish, uh, but would you really want to? That just sounds gross. Well, uh, remember in season one they smuggled stuff inside a dude's body, so at least this way it's a little sounds bit more... less gross, man. I really? Don't, you know, fish, fish gross me out. Ugh, that's why I don't swim in the lake. Ugh. Well, I suppose in this case they've actually had it in plastic bags inside the fish before the guy just shoved it right into his body straight up. Yeah, exactly. Something it's just like hanging around in there. Ugh, fish guts everywhere. It smells. That's the courier for those that forget from season one. Yeah, well, look at you with the knowledge bomb. All right, well, anyway, what turns out to be Samara and her friends uh, take a strike team to Lippitt Seafood Company, and they kill several people. So we're going to come back to that, because where I come from, that's probably treason. Seven people actually were killed in order to retrieve an integrated circuit timing chip, which can be used for several things, uh, including traffic lights and missile guiding and bombs, all kinds of stuff. Apparently, it was very important to the Amtar Hamida project. That's right. I'm not from the Middle East. I did not say that correctly. Our defense contractor, Blackthorn Kincaid, made it, and it was meant to work specifically with a surface-to-air missile, like a guiding system. So what did you think about this basic storyline? I thought it was kind of interesting to figure out that... It, and Maybe this is where it was a little jumpy for me at the beginning, was that I didn't realize that... The, the infiltrating group was Mossad until later on in the episode. And I think it would have made more sense to know that it was at least Levi's group, maybe without Samar, that did that mm -hmm. infiltration early on. Because then it would have made more sense, like, why is Libya involved out of the blue? And why are we talking about the Iron Dome guarding Israel? And a lot of that stuff, I think, was if you follow news and you follow politics and things of that nature, you understand what that stuff is. But how it relates to the overall concepts of the blacklist, we haven't really spent a lot of time with Mossad, except for when it focused around Samar, like with Zalbin Hassan. And you also, Libya has never been on the map at all. So it, maybe that's why this was a little kind of weird at the beginning. Like, I like the, the fish and the concept and the trafficking, the stuff. And it kind of seemed like that was going to be some, you know, either black site, black ops kind of situation. The guys coming in look like black ops. So it felt like it was all U.S. based until we get introduced to the Libyan side of the equation and the new Martyrs Brigade and the NMB. And I think that that was where I was a little bit confused initially. And then, of course, when it gets all revealed at the end, then you kind of have to put the pieces back together and watch it again to make sure that you understood everything. But I like well, the concept. I, I like the, the, the we need to take out the Iron Dome in Israel 
Yeah, and the only way to do that is to get these missile, uh, the, the surface-to-air missile guidance things so that they can take those down. So I think that that concept and setting up a foreign power, foreign war, I like that as a foreshadowing thing if that's the way it's going. I liked it. I thought Jack Bauer or Carrie from Homeland was going to show up at some point because <laughs> it felt more like one of those shows than it really did The Blacklist. But it was still it was an interesting uh, twist. Uh, Hassan Arkani is one of the dead, a terrorist from Nigeria, wanted around the globe which he leads them to the Seafood Company. He also leads them to the New Martyrs Brigade, also known as the NMB. That's you on the, what that was called. That's what they're called, Troy. Yep. And also to Andrew Wyatt, who lies about knowing Arcani. So there was, there was that. And obviously we always kind of like just explain the basic what happened in the episode. Then we get to each of the characters. That's how we do it in case you've never listened before. A drunk programmer named James Maddox is framed for the treasonous act by Mr. Devers, who, by the way, was played by uh, Michael O'Keefe, who you might remember from uh, Caddyshack. Noonan. Yeah, he's all right. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Devers is co- trying to cover up his involvement with Farouk Athani, who has just come to America with five of his friends to recover that chip. Boom. Why do they always come in groups of six? Wasn't it six uh, people that broke into the hospital to save Kirk, and then we got six people infiltrating the company? It's a good number. It gives you a nice little, uh, you got a leader, and you got five people to get gunned down by a wrestler at some point. <laughs> so that's that's what it is. Or driven over by a car. <laughs> Thrown into a car, my friend. <laughs> and then ran over. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, using some amazing software that apparently can locate dazzling eyes in a cinch, they take Samar hostage to torture for information leading to this chip. Mr. Devers' slimy ass takes a bullet as well, and Wrestler ultimately hunts down the chip for the missile guiding system. That was the basic crux of this week. What did you think of the overall plot, now that we actually have that surmised? Yeah, I think the concept of Samar working with Mossad and making sure that her country was defended, I think that it really set up a concept of you know Samar having this inner struggle of you know which side am I playing for? Um, NBC teased it as the mole. I don't I, I was debating this with Aaron last night on text messaging that I, I just don't feel like it is a true mole. Like when I think of a mole, I think of like Elsie, where she infiltrated her way into an organization to steal data or steal secrets to give them to somebody else. This was her still tied to Mossad in some way. I don't know if she ever technically left Mossad or she can work for both agencies. I don't know what the protocol is for that. If she has to denounce one to stay with the other, but she was doing stuff for her home country. And yes, where it's a bad thing because she didn't tell the team and didn't involve the team. And oh, some call it treasonous, but sure. Bad thing is fine. Sure. Um, but in a way she did kind of what Liz did last season. Liz made her own choice and put her team in danger to kill herself and hide herself from red. So I like that angle of it in that maybe this will bring Liz and Samar closer together as she now comes back at Agent State. It's because... Those aren't comparable, but you go ahead and you finish your thought. Well, it's not the same thing, but it's the same concept of, you know, turning your back on your team to do something of your own accord. So it's it's not the same thing. One is treasonous. One is I'm trying to save my own ass. There's a difference. But there's a thing of, is it really treasonous though? Because at the end of the day, if Libya absolutely deferring your gut, she has an, she has an, she is affiliated now with the United States government. Her loyalties lie with the United States government, not with the Mossad. And the fact that she would actually defer uh, or deter the FBI from their investigation, which she specifically said out loud, I will have them looking in other directions. That is treason. That is the very definition of treason. You are utilizing your position to deflect from uh, another organization, a foreign organization. You are being treasonous. I love Samar, but that was treason. She should be in jail for a long, 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 long time. But at the at the same time, it was Plus, in the best... straight up murdered people. <laughs> but it was in the straight best interest. Straight up murdered people. It in it, it, what? It, it, it's still in the best interest of the United States, though, because oh my God, if the Libyans were to joke. get their hands on this information, right? Libya, Nigeria, whoever, the, wherever the NMB practices, if Israel were to fall, then that's bad for the United States. So in a roundabout way, it is doing nope. something good for the U.S. Absolutely not. If she would have been doing her job, then she would have went and told them, told the FBI or the CIA or someone of government affiliation, here's where the chip is. Go get, go get it. Instead, 
She led a strike team for a foreign organization to go get it and smuggle it out behind their back. That is absolutely the very definition of treason. I, she's totally a mole. Um, you know, maybe it's not your standard TV definition of a mole, but it's definitely a mole. There's there's no getting around it, man. That is that is treason. Any In the real world, she would be locked up at Guantanamo for that. What if she planned the operation but didn't actually carry it out? Is that just That's as bad or is that better? still treason, yeah. <laughs> it's still treason. Just because you don't show up, if you're still the guy pulling the strings, Puppet Master goes down, yeah. And then when Levi is handing over the box to the guy at the cart, and then Cooper's like, yeah, just let's go ahead and see how this plays out. Isn't Cooper treasonous then because he's helping Mossad? Uh, as soon as Cooper lets her slide, that's treason too. Yeah, he's complicit. Okay. I mean, I'm just saying that we can we can dance around laws, but they are laws. <laughs> that is definitely a law. <laughs> But whatever, and I was a member of the United States government. I'm telling you that I would be, I would be in a, I would be in a small, quiet cell that no one would probably hear from me for a very long time if my name was Samar Samar Navabi at the sprint. But it's TV, and you know you afford some. This team has gone off book quite a bit, and a lot of people are going to point to, well, you know, it's a black ops operation, da 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 da, or whatever. And sure, but it's still treason. Uh, I would have a hard time if I was Cooper. I would have a hard time saying, all right, we're cool. Even if you come back to work the next day, we're cool. That's why I clarify. Yeah. You would not be in a cell. You'd be in a hole in the ground somewhere. I probably would be, and I'd have it coming, too. Absolutely. <laughs> um, my biggest <laughs> – I had three main TV issues with this episode. And I, I'm not mad about the fact that she was cleared. I'm just saying – I'm just arguing with you. I'm not arguing with the show. I get it's you know, it's the blacklist, and that's what they're going to do. And they're just basically trying to tell dramatic television. I get it. But you're saying it's not treasonous, and I'm telling you, 100% treason. But um, my, I had three TV-related issues with the show. One is that that software recognized her from her eyes. Come on now. But they, I mean, but they explained it in the show that we have this new technology that can... That is crap. <laughs> that is Expo- crap. Exposition solves everything. Oh, my God. What is it? Identifying retinas now? Come on. That was such. I'm watching that going. Well, that's TV magic. That's what that is. Uh, I mean, you just let it slide. It's one of those things where you're like, okay, all right. I mean, you explained it enough. I guess I'll have to swallow it. But it was definitely, you know, when it was over, I'm like, I don't think we're at a point where we can do that. But okay, the, the technology is super advanced. I mean, it was a great 3D rendering. It looked just like her. It was. It looked exactly like her. Her eyes really tell the story. You know what I mean? <laughs> all right. I could tell it was Let's, her before they even undressed the mask. From the uh, eyes. Well, I was just, I was laughing to myself because as soon as they pulled up her little, her face and, you know, the show, the composite or whatever, I'm like, wow, this is a magic program. This is literally a Harry Potter program. I love it. Uh, all right. Let's get into the characters like we always do. Let's well, start wait, with music. No, no, you said you had three things. You only, you only said no, one. No, no, no. I'm going to tell you the other two when we get there. Oh, okay. Well, my, my one thing that was an issue for this episode was that. Uh, because it was out for eight weeks and it happened, it did go- run across the promo for the episode. And they're like, oh, who's the mole? They actually showed Cooper giving, you know, Samar, you know, th- the story, the-, the yelling, the fit at the end. And you could see Samar's back of her head, her curly hair. So, uh, from so the, I didn't watch the promo. From, so the, I didn't. from the get go, it's like we knew Samar was behind it. So it kind of took away the big reveal of, oh, Samar led the attack. And you're like, can I ask uh, you a question? Yeah. This is a legitimate question. This is the second or third time you've complained about the NBC promos uh, because of and, – and I want to remind the audience, you know, the, the the guys behind the blacklist, John and those guys, they aren't responsible for the advertising. Correct. So don't hold them accountable for that. Yes. But but I know you've really, like, really had a problem with the misleading and um, – The Kaplan thing. Yeah, yeah, the Kaplan thing and some other stuff. Uh, my question to you is, why do you keep watching them then? I didn't. I, I specifically. And people say, well, how do you avoid them? I never watch them. And I, I avoid them just fine. I did my best. I was not watching it because I wanted to be surprised, entertained. And I was watching something on NBC and I was folding towels and laundry or whatever. And then, of course, it was like, coming up on the blacklist. And I was like, crap, find the remote, find the remote, find the remote, run, <laughs> leave the room. I, mm. I, I was not fast enough. And then I was like, oh, snap. It's Samar. And then sure so enough, it's your lazy Midwestern reflexes. Well, because the first time you watch it, if you didn't know what was going on, like when she's talking to the the guy who runs the seafood company and she has this, she looks up at the camera and then she looks mm-hmm. back down. If you didn't know it was Samar, you'd be like, oh, she just wants to get the film from the camera. But when you know it's Samar, you're like, oh, she wants to get that film because she doesn't want to get caught. And you completely look at that scene totally differently if you if you know the outcome. True. 
That's true. So anybody that did watch the promo, it wasn't as enjoyable, I don't think, because they kind of ruined it. Uh, and also, I think I already named I named my two of my things because I named uh, Samar the being treasonous and how she would never have ever have her job back, and the other one, um, what was the first one? <laughs> <laughs> there was mean, one, there's two, there's three things. All right, let's the, go into the music. Yeah, the facial the facial recognition was your second. facial recognition. Yeah, I'm. St- <laughs> I laugh every time I think about. It. All right, let's go to music. All right, this episode kicks off with the Fish and Blues from the Love and Spoonful, as we see employees working with Hassan Arkani to remove chips from the bellies of dead fish. That was funny. Later, when Le- uh, Levi confesses to Samar that he broke off his engagement, uh, foreshadowing, we hear the vanishing act. from. <laughs> right? the- like, and they're like, you should be happy. I'm like, wow, you're pretty confident, aren't you? Hey, you should hey. be happy. I almost I heard like Joey from Friends. How you doing? You should be happy. You know? Uh, so the engagements broke off. We hear vanishing act from the group Early Winters. And as the episode draws to a close and Liz is reinstated as an FBI agent, Yola Tengo's All Your Secrets plays out as an overjoyed Liz Keen accepts her badge. Aw. <sighs> okay, that'll lead to my third thing, but I'll, I'll wait till we get there. <laughs> All right, so this week in characters, there are no Kaplan. There is no Dembe. With one Dembe. Was her Dembe? Yeah, I think he hands him the phone. Like, there's oh, one yeah, shot of yeah. him in the front. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. You're right. Uh, but we do have Wendy. Wendy's who, awesome. <laughs> yeah, who's another red informant. I don't think we've seen her in the show before, have we? I don't recall her. She was, She seemed new to me. Okay. She is a stellar mother, by the way. She is doing laundry while she's getting information for Red. And I like her. Do you want to see Wendy back? I absolutely do. I think this is something that you could actually use her as kind of leverage you know, to throw some information out there as the stories go on for the rest of the season. I mm-hmm. think that'd be really fun to see her where she plugs in and how red gets info. It's always wondered like, how does red know all this stuff? That's one thing that's always bothered me over the years was where does red get all this information? And we did get to see that group. I want to say it was at the start of season three where they were going, maybe it was the end of season two. The the guys were going through all the paper that was cut up and trying to piece it back together. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so we know he has the syndicate, right? His his group of people. But it's always interesting to see that Red just happens to get this information. So it'd be nice to meet some of the more of the syndicate. I think. Yeah, I really enjoyed Wendy. I, I hope Wendy comes back. Uh, Tom Keen is barely here, and we get <laughs> we get the uh, little statement that now that he's dead, um, you know, he might see things a little different. He is getting a little bit of that paternal itch. You know, that it might sound like he wants to go meet his mom, you think? Well, it sounded like he actually wanted to see out, find out where, because he already knows who his mom is. It sounded like he was saying he wants to know who his dad is. No, that's not, well, that too. I, I definitely think that too. But I also think he was, it was foreshadowing for his spinoff. That's what I, that's what I got out of the episode. Guess what, you know, Tom? When, we know who your dad is and we're excited about it. Who's his dad? I don't want to say, I don't want to spoil it for people that don't want to know. Oh, is it out there? Yeah, the uh, who they cast. Oh, shh. Yeah, who they cast for it. It's out there. So I don't want to know. If you I don't want to know. If you want to know, you can go find out. Okay. You go You go Google it, because I don't want to know. You'll be excited. I was. Well, that's really all Tom had to do here, other than tell Liz to check out the news. So, anything on Tom Keen? Uh, no. I think he's uh, slowly going to fade into the background and then leave the show. I don't. I, we'll have to see at least one episode of whatever happens to get him to go to the spinoff. Um, but yeah, it's interesting because I still don't know what to make of him. Is this still Tom being the, you know, doting father, loving husband, or is this Tom still playing a role? I, I, there's something about him and the thing that he said at the end of the fall finale when, when Red came in and said, did it work? So it's almost like they're, they have a thing between the two of them. Some, some game that they're playing still, like he's still working for Red. And so that's interesting, and I want to see how that plays out over the next seven weeks. Hmm. Okay. Cooper. Finally, we get some Harold Cooper that we've been waiting for. Um, He finally scolds Red for playing him. He still hasn't yelled at Liz, and Troy is very, very upset about that. But he has. I'm convinced. (laughs) I am convinced now that he was in on the fake the death thing. If that makes you sleep at night, fine, but he wasn't. (laughs) <laughs> uh, he just he just isn't going to yell at her. What do you want me to tell you? It's not going to happen. For those that have never listened, Troy is really mad that Harold hasn't yelled at Liz for faking her death yet. She shot the AG and became the agent that he didn't want her to become. Fakes oh, her own death. It. Goes behind. We got it. I mean, we come on, it. Harold. You got to have the father conversation with her. 
Unless you're in on it, which I totally believe now. I really believe you're the only person that cares about this, but that's cool. There are people. So there are pe- if you're out there, let us know in the yeah, Facebook group. Yeah, I'm or- sure you've recruited a nice little, uh, nice little movement, just like you did in that whole mom theory. I mean, you work hard at it. I give you credit. Hey, TV Good guy's even in on it now. So, oh my god, I could. Can we <laughs> mention that for a second? That now Entertainment Weekly and TV Guide are running the articles on and, is and, is and red uh, and Cineblend was on it too. We don't count Cineblend. Come on, again, that's not, Cinema Blend is not really a trade publication. Uh, so the other ones, are, they're, they're running articles on is red actually Katarina, like it's new. Man, it ain't new. Troy's been talking about this since season one, like since the first episode, I think. So, shh, come on now. That, did you feel kind of vindicated in some way? This is the only point of the show. We're going to mention this theory. But did you feel vindicated in any way? I was excited to see that it was out there. I was. I have to. I had a little smile on my face over the holidays, I have to admit. God, if you end up being right, my, I'm never going to hear the end of it. All right. So and anyway. It was, and, we, and we got confirmation for a new blacklister who just started watching that it was episode uh 10 i believe episode 10 is where the mother theory comes up originally it was called the sex change theory so mother theory sounds a little bit better i I know for a fact you've thought about it for a very very long time so i i got it so all the people are like i thought of it too no we i've heard it from mr troy long before the internet ever really started talking about it so Mm -hmm. you popularized it is what i would say yes brought it into the zeitgeist (laughs) there you go (laughs) Well, now it's a zeitgeist because the media is covering it. Yeah, like it's new. That cracked me up, though. I was reading that going, you guys are acting like this is a new thing, man. This isn't new. Like, But thanks for catching up. We appreciate it. So anyway, Cooper finally scolds Red for, for playing him and how Red is powerless to rectify it. Foreshadowing. <laughs> uh, he also thinks it's crazy that they haven't reinstated Liz already. Okay, I just want to speak to that for a second. Uh, Cooper, no, it's not. She shot the attorney general. It is not crazy that they didn't reinstate her. It makes total sense. She straight up killed the attorney general, guilty or not. She straight up shot him, point blank. Am I wrong? Yeah, she was pardoned for her you know, complacency in the event, but there's no way she can be an agent because she's still guilty. You know, it's, it's like a no contest plea, but if you have a no contest plea, you can't be a criminal and be an FBI agent. I think it's on the application. Absolutely. But what I'm saying is he thinks it's crazy. She hasn't been. I don't know how you could think that. I mean, I get he likes Liz and he, he cares for her. He loves her, whatever. But I'll, be, I'll tell you what, if it was my own daughter and she shot the attorney general, I'd be like, well, you don't deserve to be an FBI agent no more. I mean, that's cool. You get to walk around and everything, but you probably shouldn't have a badge. Right. Because you shoot people. <laughs> you can have a badge, <laughs> just not a gun. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, so... um. What did you think about the whole scolding red scene? I think it was fun. It was it, it, if we assume I thought it was great. I yeah, thought it was really good. If, actually, if we assume that Red and Cooper, because Red is Red and not anybody else, that they've had this long history together as mm-hmm. as two friends or colleagues or war buddies or whatever you want to call it, based on the Kuwait thing, then yeah, absolutely. I think this is the two of them are able to go toe to toe and have these honest conversations, which is really interesting when you take a look at it from the flip side. When he was sitting in the uh, completely cut off from the world Ms. Pac-Man break room, and they're having a completely different conversation, like they're like happy to be working together. Here he's back in his chair of authority, so now he throws down the authority at the same time. So I love that when Cooper is in charge, he is large and in charge. Look at that. Well, I really enjoyed it. I liked uh, Red getting yelled at. I thought that was pretty good. He needs more of that. Plus, it should have happened. It needed to happen. If it wouldn't happen at some point, I would be probably upset as a viewer because, I mean, he did kind of play them and then let Kirk slip away. So is the is the nice chat, Harold, is that, uh, is that uh, him saying, I concede, yes, I understand what you're saying, or is that, I'm not going to continue to talk to you right now. I'm just going to walk away. I think that was him saying, uh, your point is noted, and that's all I'm going to say about it. Okay. Because he doesn't yeah. want to give in and may, may say he's wrong, right? Right. Right. Um, right. 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 So he asked Panna Baker for reinstatement. She says, hell no, as it really should be, because she shot a guy. And uh, but by the end, she gets her badge back and he's he's pretty happy. And I'm coming back. That's my other point. But I'm going to come back to that. So what did you think about um, Cooper's elation that she has her badge back? Because now, you know, he's never going to yell at her. 
Yeah, I think that at this point, because he had the stern conversation about if you pull that trigger, you won't be the person I thought you were. And then he does this great eulogy over her death and everything. I think this shows us that no matter what, Cooper will always have Liz's back and he'll even break the law or bend the law in order to make sure Liz is 100% safe and on board. And at, at some point, you can almost say that he's almost a little bit controlling in that way. Maybe. It sure seems like everybody can break the law in this unit. Uh, Rustler had a little, a great little back and forth with Liz, which was sorely missed, uh, in my opinion. But we're going to see it more now because now that she's an agent, they can be partners again. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Now that, now that she does have her badge back, are they going to be partners again? I mean, what happens to Samar then? Samar's grounded, man. She was a mole. She committed treason. She can't be out in the field. We got to take her badge away, too. You got to give her a two week probation. Two episodes, and then she's back on the street. <laughs> yeah, that way she can spend more time with Samar or uh, with Aram. And yeah, getting... I think she spends all of her time with Samar. Yeah, I mean that's her actual name. So yeah, I was thinking of Saram, the the, the hashtag <laughs> Saram. <laughs> uh, also, does does wrestler not know you can actually shoot a drone? Like the second it went up, he could have just pulled his gun and shot. That it. was my number two. <laughs> I mean, there's there's the there's the crowded room and everything and there's rules about you know raising your gun in crowds and shooting in an open crowd and all that stuff but the minute the drone gets like five feet ten feet in the air boom one bullet take out one of the propellers you're you're good i mean it's just sitting there taking polaroids of them and it's hey shoot it somebody shoot it i was yelling i literally yelled at my screen shoot it (laughs) anyway but i couldn't do it i would um, risk hitting the device yeah i suppose but wouldn't that still be good I mean, either way, you win. Yeah, that's true. Right? You don't lose with that. Uh, the one thing I, w- I do want to say, I am really happy that that he is going to get more screen time, I would assume now, because Liz has her badge back. So we, we can spend more time with Liz and Wrestler as a team, which means Wrestler's finally going to get some more screen time. I, I do feel like he's been kind of an afterthought this season, and I, I would like to see him get a little bit more. And I think it was fun seeing Wrestler and Samar together in the field as partners, but it felt very, you know, cops, basic, you know, uh, what do you Law call it? Law and order. Law and order, yeah, CSI kind yeah. of thing. It wasn't the fun Mulder Scully relationship from season one. Right. So I would be really excited if we go back to that Mulder Scully season one type relationship going forward. I really like the fight. I like that wrestler gets bitten. And then uh, after he gets bitten, he tosses Farouk into a car like he was a garden gnome. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was fantastic. That was a great fight scene. Uh, probably the, my favorite part of the episode, honestly. Oh, and then you see the body get rolled over, and he just kind of looks down at him and says, "Yep, you did." He just keeps on walking. Yeah, exactly. Because that because that's I, not breaking the law or anything. <laughs> just letting a guy die could at least call nine one one or something. He just. I always love that they just walk away. <laughs> and I, the other thing, this is a TV trope. It happens in every TV show, so I'm not knocking the blacklist for it. But it always makes me laugh when it happens. Is when they uh, they track down uh, what was the guy's name James um, Maddox or uh, the the drunk. Oh, and the car pulls out and just happens to run into the, the car. The car just happens to pull out right right as they're chasing him down, and he hits the car. Th- those that happens in almost every TV show, and it cracks me up every single time. I just <laughs> I'm just like, does the guy in the car not go, "Hey, get off my car" or something? <laughs> I mean, you would think, but what are you gonna do? Yeah, roll down the window, grab his tie. Hey, I got him. He's right here. Exactly. Now, we always do characters in order of importance in the episode. Liz is the next. Actually, Cooper is probably a little more important in this episode than Rustler, but oh well. Uh, Liz is making family videos in the warehouse and even brings Boz into the video. That was a nice touch. It was super cute. It was super mm-hmm. cute. I'm pretty sure. Is that a different baby? <laughs> it's got to be, right? Because he- that baby's head got bigger. Well, remember, we went from Senator Diaz to President-elect Diaz. It's so true. Th- it's been a while. It has been yeah. a while. And it seems like they've been living in that warehouse for a while because she's like, where's the sun? It's like winter. And and I did see like a, there were several people knocking the whole making the family video. I thought it was really cute. I thought it was like, really I, cute. And I'm the guy that doesn't like the whole baby storyline. And I thought that was really cute. So I, I guess maybe because I'm a dad and I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff. But it rang true to me. So I was fine with it. And I thought um, Megan seemed like definitely seemed like a mom. Well, and that it was, was a, it was, was the transition good. too. You're coming in off of this fish and guts and seafood and bullets mm-hmm. and dead bodies, and then it's like. Oh, it's Agnes. <laughs> now, if it did that every episode, that would it would be get old really fast. It, it would be yeah. grown inducing, yeah. But that was that was super cute. I thought it was cute. 
And it wasn't, it was that one scene. Uh, the baby wasn't the whole episode. Uh, Liz wasn't kidnapped in this episode. You know, it, it was good that we were back on a little bit of blacklist traction. We're getting more, we're getting the other characters more involved again. You know, that kind of stuff. So that, that helps. Well, and the, and a good thing is they established that with this one scene, they established that if Tom and Liz are out somewhere, there is someone watching Agnes. It's not like you're like, you're, who's watching Agnes if everybody's out? <laughs> there are yeah, at least exactly. people that are taking care of the baby. Exactly. Uh, she really gets a little else to do this episode. She does get to to do some interrogation. Um, and she does voice her concerns that this guy's innocent when he's obviously being framed fantastically. And But she's also trying to get her badge back. And by the episode's end, she is officially Agent Liz Keen again. And I'm going to hold my number one until we get to red. But uh, are you are you happy that she is Liz Keen, that she is Agent Liz Keen again? From a storytelling perspective and things that you can do with her character going forward, absolutely 100% glad she's got her badge back. From a legality, government, how this all works out, uh, no. But the only, <laughs> the only way it could happen is with a presidential pardon. And we just happen to know a guy who is running for president. So it totally works. Thank goodness we had that ace in the hole, huh? Right. <laughs> All right. Well, so, that, so that pe- is so people that definitely a TV trope. Come on now. Well, and, and for people that don't think that there's a grand plan, I mean, that's a grand plan because that was the end of season three and it took till the mid of season four for it to pay off, but it paid off. Mm-hmm. So it it did. I'll tell you what, I was not expecting centered. And actually, you and I had talked about this. I don't know if we talked about it on the show or not. Was the only way she could ever get her badge back is if she was completely pardoned by the president. Yep. So there you, there go. you go. There you go. Uh, we'll, we'll wait for our check in the mail. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that they, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that they thought of that long before we ever did. So, okay, now we move on to red because that was really all that Liz had to do. Is uh, unless there's something else that I'm missing. The the one interesting thing about Liz was the little back and forth between wrestler and how she's like, I just don't know. I see something about this guy that's a little off. So mm-hmm. I love that she's using her kind of profiling. Yeah, superpower yeah, like sensing that. in that without saying she was profiling him, but it, I, I think that's the one thing that was weird was she doesn't have a badge, so why is she in interrogating him? Because I don't think that works. She's just an informant, not a true cop at that moment. So that was a little weird. But the fact that she was able to profile and deduce that he was being set up, I think, is nice. But it didn't really play off all that bigger, right? It's not like she was the one that brought it to light that he was being framed. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of a, a little bit of a miss there, but I, I like well, the profiling I, I, is still there. I think the reason they had her question is because she's a profiler. So she could ascertain if he was guilty or uh, if there's more at play here that they're not seeing, that sort of thing. True, true. It made sense that to makes me. Sense. Yeah, it made sense to me. Now, Red, we get to Red, who is really third, third in the line this episode, which is kind of surprising. But uh, he constantly calls Liz Agent Keen. Obviously, he knew foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. And then Red blackmails the president-elect to pardon her and get her title back. Now, here's my number three issue with the with – the, not for nothing, but can the president-elect actually do that? Uh, that's a really good question because that's where I was confused myself. He said something in the conversation with Diaz that – there was some strenuous relationship between him and the current POTUS or information that would get out that would hurt that relationship or something. So it seemed, I think, that Red was blackmailing Diaz so that Diaz would talk to current POTUS and the current POTUS actually did the pardon as his last thing on his way out the door. Because I only think the POTUS can do the pardons. Yeah, that's it. Only the POTUS. Now, I don't see. Here's the thing that that was confusing to me, and I'm sure somebody's going to catch it. And somebody's going to point it out. But it did seem that way to me too. It did seem like either either uh, Diaz worked it out with the current president to pardon him because they did talk about how the president usually pardons people in their final hours, or um, the president elect did it like as his first act, which I can't imagine that would happen. So, how, however it happened, the president pardoned. Liz. Because the inauguration was only a few days away, if I remember correctly, from the conversation that they were having right. with uh, Marlon. So maybe so it, it is could a, easily be the first act. Yeah, it could be a couple days later, right? Yeah, because I, I don't think that, I don't know, I mean, I, I guess the president does pardon a whole bunch of people as they're leaving office, and that's pretty common. So that 
could happen that Diaz asked him to throw Liz Keene on there. But I would be surprised since Red had nothing on the current president that it really feels like it would be Diaz who did it as soon as he took office. What was up with the mustache? Uh, I don't know. Was he train? Is he maybe rehearsing for seventies uh, porn? I don't know what's going on with that, but it was definitely a, like what? what? I mean, I love that Red actually said something about it too. It was like, "What's up with the? Mu- I love the mustache." It was like, "Wow!" Just uh, I, <laughs> if, if my president looks like that, I'm going to be scared. <laughs> really, I don't think you want to go there right now. Um, <laughs> not this year, my friend. Well, I don't think Trump could grow <laughs> one, but. <laughs> Uh, well, we could talk about that hair. We could go over there. there. I mean, yeah. that mustache is still better than that hair. So don't um, – that's my other issue with it, but it's a TV thing. We, I kind of thought it was going to have to happen if they were ever going to go back to that. Troy and I had talked about it. Like I said, I don't know if it was on the show or not. but So we kind of thought eventually that was going to have to happen. Kind of surprising the way it did happen, but it works. It definitely was set up with uh, the senator a long time ago with the Kirk thing. So. And, and the one thing to point out about Red here, too, when he's talking to Cooper at the beginning of the show, uh, he used that uh, your government, your country, your people statement again. Just wanted to point that yes. out. Yes. Very, very astute, sir. Very astute. He also basically Red outs Samar as a traitorous mole. <laughs> he does kind that, of, doesn't he? That kind of surprised me. I, I really thought maybe he would play it a little closer to the vest and under the radar, but he just threw it out there. He's like, mm, oh, yeah, that's Samar. She's totally playing you guys, by the way. Which we still haven't had that that conversation about that Red actually planted Samar in the task force to begin with back in season two. Uh, then, we've had that conversation oh, yeah. many times because you won't the, let it go. The, <laughs> the show hasn't talked about it in, in, in any such detail, but then here Red just throws her under the bus. Mm-hmm. So that, that that has to probably put some strain on a relationship, potentially. <laughs> you think? <laughs> you just burned a bridge, I would assume, but you, you never know. But he definitely, uh, he ratted her out. All right, now we get to our final two. And this really, I would say this entire episode was more about Aram and Samara than anybody. Agree. Do you agree? Okay. A- absolutely. So let's start with Aram, who I've often called the heart of the show, even though this is the main character. I, I find Aram to be the heart of the show. He seems to to have the most genuine uh, interest in doing what's right and following the guidebook and the law and everything. Uh, it, he We find out he's going through a thing, as he doesn't know if he's a traitor or a moron, while Panabaker drills him over his choice in women. Now, are you actually surprised... Based on all the things that characters have done in this show over the course of its four seasons, that we actually have a review board for Aram? I think that because of the way everything has gone down, that a review board is always in place, right? You already have, always have internal affairs mm-hmm. of some kind. It's just funny that we chose to do the review board with Aram, but I think it's because it actually makes for better television, right? Because he's so squirmy and he's, he's all sweaty and doesn't know how it's going to turn out and he's really concerned for his job and it just makes for a better dramatic scene than say Liz going in front of the review board which, in which she kind of did when she did that judge episode in season two in a way yes yeah I um I, I, I'm a huge fan of Aram I think I've always said that hashtag Aram Dorable it's it's definitely a character that I love and is really really um the heart for the show for me personally. So to see him going through that, I thought that was a good television. I, I like when Aram is front and center because Amir always brings a warmth and uh, a realism to it. Yeah. Very, yeah, there you go. A, a very realistic edge to it. Like I believe this guy is going through hell, you know, I mean, he just, he's a very natural actor and there aren't many actors in, in the world that play natural as well as he does. I, honestly, I mean that sincerely. He does natural wonderfully, and he seems genuinely like a guy we would want to have a beer with and hang out with. And and to see him go through that, I thought was was really it was almost heartbreaking because I'm like, oh, when he goes through this choice in women, and he finally realizes that his belief that every the, the good in everyone, his belief system is really what the problem is, and he starts <laughs> rattling off all the bad choices in women. I mean, I'm laughing and also kind of sad at the same time, and and only. Uh, I think only uh, Amir could really play that. So it it really worked wonders, I thought. And especially the second time around when all the information wasn't a problem for me because I'd already went through it. So I got to just sit back and enjoy the character's arc for what it was. It it was really well done. 
And it sets up that confrontation then between him and Samar at the end of the episode because he's coming to that realization that, you know, I, I do have bad taste in women. And if I want to tr- truly trust myself with someone, I can't have someone who's duplicitous in nature be with me. And so I, I love that it kind of sets that up, that internal struggle that he has in his brain about it. Yeah, and I really... At least, I, at actually, least for now, for now. I, I really like that they went this way. Now, it's one of those things where you know whenever a couple is close to getting together, they all TV always breaks them apart, right? Because they, you have to have a conflict, otherwise it's not really good television. They do? Oh, man, I don't know not, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In case you're new to television, yeah, <laughs> this happens quite a bit. Now, sure, you can make it, and I think eventually they're going to have a relationship of some sort. Uh, but he finally gets that date with Samara, and I just know it's going to go south. It just has to, because as soon as he, that happens, I'm like, well, this is going to end bad. I hope she doesn't die. I like Samara. I don't want, I don't want her to leave the show. Um, but he gets that date, and then all of our you know, hopes and dreams are crushed by, by him doing the smartest thing he's done in a while and telling Samara he can't date somebody like that like you were talking about. But he says that after he says someone he could see himself marrying, someone he could see himself growing old with, it was a really warm, sweet moment. And it was also the smartest thing I've seen on the show in a long time because it it felt not like television or not like a hyper-realized uh, drama. It felt like something a real person would do. And I really, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, did you like just melt in your chair when he's like someone I could see myself with for a long time? I was like, oh my god, he's gonna propose, but not. No, I didn't say that. I didn't think that. I, I really, as soon as he said that, I'm like, oh, this is gonna go south. <laughs> this is gonna go bad pretty quick. But uh, I, I just really love the performance and uh, the way that the character was written this episode. I thought that was really well done. Um, which leads me to Samar and how Mojan played it very close to the vest like she always does she really plays the character very stoic and in that moment her very subtle acting uh i thought worked great because she doesn't show him how it's affecting her until he turns away and i thought that was that was even more heartbreaking like she finally realized oh i'm the problem <laughs> and then she realized and, and that's what it takes for her to realize it because then she goes to levi and says, sorry, Levi, I know you broke up with your fiance, but uh, I can't be with you because I love someone else. <gasps> yes. Gasp. Oh. Agent Levi, sure. Who you're a big fan of. I, I mean, yeah. you're a big fan of o- Oded Fair. Oded Fair has been uh, one of the... I've, sometimes you feel bad for him because every time you see him, he's kind of typecast as the Mossad agent. Uh, really loved his work in uh, Covert Affairs. It, it just seems like it, every time he pops up, he's doing some kind of Mossad stuff. So... Then you forget that he was actually in Deuce Bigelow Male Gigolo, right? Hell yeah. Now that's <laughs> where I remember him from. Deuce Bigelow Male Gigolo. <laughs> Maybe that's what he was doing all winter. There He's, you go. He's, uh, you know, hooking. By the way, if you haven't seen it, go watch the first movie. It's actually really funny, but he, he's he's really funny in it. Uh, so we've got that. So we know that Samara's a mole because NBC's promo department told us. Uh, <laughs> she does acknowledge that she will divert the FBI. That's treasonous, by the way. Again, I want to point out how it's treason. You shouldn't have your job back, but it's cool. It's, I, it's I agree TV. with you on the treason part. I just don't agree on the mole part. Mole just doesn't seem like the right word. Go look up the definition. It works. Uh, I, I loved, we got to mention it because I loved my favorite, my second favorite moment of the show is when she's taken and they plan on torturing her and they tell her and she's like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was great. It was a nice, nice touch. Well played, very stoic as she, as she is. And yes, the one thing that she does that really made me happy and smile and gleeful and excited for this episode of TV was all of us are led to the revelation that she does love Aram. She finally says it, and she also is willing to make the right choice to make this relationship work. She literally tells Levi she isn't going to be his lady. She's waiting for the PC guy. And thank God, I was so afraid after Aram said, I'm not, you know, I can't do this with you, da 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 that she was going to go do that thing that TV always does where she falls, goes back to the old guy. And I, that would have really crushed my spirits as a viewer, I think. Mm. Like you know I, what I'm talking about? I totally do. I, I was just stuck on the whole PC guy. Like, Rom can't use a Mac? Really? <laughs> <laughs> he knows better. Because he knows Apple won't let him do anything. So he's got to get a PC. I just know how much you feel for Samar, and I know you're a PC guy. So I see what you're doing there. It's, it's totally fine. 
Mm-hmm. What else? Yeah, not a Mac guy. And I do love some art. So what what did you think about that? Because I was really worried that was the avenue they were going. Because first we had Levi telling us that, you know, he broke off his engagement. Then we have Aram saying he can't do this. Did you think she was going to go back to Levi? Well, and I think that's where character development really comes into play here. Because we saw that she jumped into bed with Wrestler when things got tough. After the, the whole Zal bin Hassan thing. And... Mm-hmm. It's very similar to be like, okay, is this where she grows as a character or does she do the same thing? She just got rejected. So is she going to jump into bed with Levi because she knows that there's a warm body waiting for her and it's just going to be a thing? Or is she going to transcend? And I love the fact that she actually transcends and realizes that, yeah, I do have feelings for Aram and I I, I can't jump into bed with you because I I know this is to be true and I'm going to work at it. So I really love the character progression. I think that's fantastic that they went there. It is fantastic. But and I do want to wait, wait hang on. I want to suggest in case they need to throw another love interest curve at her. Can you name it? Aaron Peterson. I, I'm just a suggestion. <laughs> it's an idea. I will just go with Aaron and we'll just know. <laughs> that, that's fine. And also, if you are looking for casting, I'm, I'm available. Now, this is my my big one for this this episode that I had an issue with. Uh, and I know we just kind of finished up on a, on a nice, high, lovey, fluffy part. But the thing with this was. <laughs> It's it's ten o'clock and it's the episode back from the break. And oh, the torture thing! The right? torture thing. Yes, absolutely. She made this. You know, this is where the conversation with Cooper at the end kind of falls a little flat because there really was no stakes in this. She does this op. She plans the whole thing. She ends up getting kidnapped and she's kind of strung up. She headbutts the guy, and the guy Farouk. I mean, he seemed like he was a badass initially. And then he kind of seems a little bit weak because there there was no torture. There was no her life yeah. never seemed like it was in danger. So I was never yeah. concerned about it. And then when she kind of gets out of the van and, and it's not the acting thing or whatever, it's just you know she's stumbling out of the van because she was strung up for a little while. But there was no consequence. There was no, gosh, I realize I made a bad choice by doing this and my life was put at risk, which would make the Cooper scene that much more powerful because she's sitting there either with a gash in her face or a wound or something. I, I just think that was a miss for me for this episode. That would have really put it over the top. Uh, I, I would agree in, in some respect. I think she really understood the weight of her actions more from the Aram relationship issue and how it made the person that she loves, which she admitted that she finally loves him, um, look at her in a negative way. I think that hurt her more than Cooper, you know. Agree. Like scolding, scolding her. But I, I definitely get what you're saying, and I do think – Look, she made the declaration, I'm good, which is like, oh, she's Billy Badass. She can take it. But then she, there's nothing really thrown at her. Exactly. I mean, exactly. Yeah, I, I get what you're saying. There, there needed to be a little bit something. You're in that later hour. Cut her up a little bit. I mean, do something. Oh, that sounds <laughs> that sounded harsh. I don't mean that. I just, you know, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, because saying. even though she does come to the realization with a ROM and it, it works, I think it works Maybe it works better, and maybe that's why they didn't do it. Maybe it was too much, but at the same time, if she was at that, you know, I almost died, therefore, now I could come into the situation and realize, oh, I really made bad choices, and I could die, therefore, I should do the thing that I should follow my heart with, which is be with Aram. I mean, that all could have progressed in very, very easily, but maybe it is a little bit too heavy-handed. I don't know. Yeah, I, I totally understand what you're saying. On the flip side, I will say kudos to the writers for avoiding the the whole sexual Oh, yes, 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 thing. yes. Thank you. God. Thank you. Ugh. I hate when they, because it's like always the go to when you have a woman being held hostage. Let's sexually, let's torture her with sexual innuendo and that sort of thing. I hate that. Well, he did, he did so draw the knife down her, down her arm, but, but they that stopped really, there. That's not the same thing. Yeah. It really felt like just like a, a dude would be tortured, which is how it should be. Yep, yep. Really. All right. Now, show's not over, so do not go anywhere. But please remember to download the Blacklist Exposed app for iOS and Android, or be sure to go even deeper into the mystery of Red Reddington by visiting our partner Blacklist site, theblacklistnbc.com. In regards to the Blacklist Redemption, we want to talk about that real quick. Due to some other commitments, when that show comes on, Troy and I have uh, other commitments going on during the run of that show. So we won't be able to do a weekly show for the time frame. I know, sad face. However, we will cover Redemption in a two-part special podcast that will air in in April of 2017. We will cover episodes 
one through four in that first podcast, and then episodes five through eight in the second podcast, just before the return of the final six Blacklist episodes mid-April. So you'll still get our take on redemption, just in a more kind of compacted, broad view as it relates to the general mythos of the overall Blacklist universe, quote-unquote. Yeah, because there'll be people that I know are very adamant about not watching the Tom show because they don't like Tom and all everything that Tom stands for, but there are going to be <laughs> Blacklist universe things that may shed light. I think light. most Blacklist fans are going to watch it. I would honestly. think so. I would hope they would, especially when you find out who Tom's father is. <laughs> Damn so it, exciting. Troy. I didn't even know that was going to be part of it. Thanks for ruining that. <laughs> um, but uh, the thing there is that we want to make sure that you do have the information for those that do not watch Redemption because it's your choice and you have that right. Uh, but if you do not watch it, we want you to at least have where it ties back into the Blacklist overall and the Mythos so that you are informed for the final six when it comes back. Oh, also, we should mention, uh, we originally, before we went on hiatus, promised you an interview with John Volkenkamp. Uh, that was originally going to happen, I think, before this episode, but unfortunately, scheduling was a problem. We're going to rectify that in the near future, uh, hopefully before Redemption starts. So hopefully we'll have some information on this season of Blacklist, as well as we'll have uh, some scuttlebutt. Like a, a redemption from, preview, kind of, yeah. There you go, from John. So look for that. Uh, it'll be closer to when Redemption comes out, but I think we have it reworked out. But it was just a schedule of conflict. Yeah, all. running two shows. It's a little busy. We understand. It's totally cool. Absolutely. Totally cool. With that, we'll be right back with Red's Rhetoric right after this. Are you sick of the endless, poorly realized remakes as we are? And take a listen to Remake This Movie Right, where we take a classic movie, figure out what works and what doesn't, throw a dash of humor at it, and then we craft our own remake. So by the end of every episode, we will remake this movie right. Recently featured as a podcast to listen to by the AV Club, you can find us at RemakeThisMovieRight.com or your podcast app of choice. Every movie you love will get a remake someday, and only you can make it better. Welcome to Red's Rhetoric, that part of the show where we play two scenes from this week's episode, and then you get to vote which one you think is better over at theblacklistexposed.com. Just look for the post for Lippitz Seafood Company. Last time, 58% of you said that you would love to take dance class as Red Jim won the last Red's Rhetoric back before the break, if you remember that one. This week, our first clip comes when Red has his first meeting with Marlin. I'm not here. <laughs> this meeting never took place and you will never be in the same room with the president-elect you really should try Ginny's cheeseburger chowder the ground chuck and spices the melted cheese I highly recommend it for the inaugural balls if you think you can maintain your immunity agreement by blackmailing the president-elect for allegedly taking illegal campaign contributions from Alexander Kirk. You're not as smart as everyone says you are. Marlon, your boss made a campaign promise to me, and I intend to make sure he keeps it. Tell Robert I'll be in touch. Our second clip comes are when Red and Marlon talk about his drinking problem. Oh, boy. <clears throat> Isn't this a sticky wicket? You son of a bitch. As I mentioned, Senator Diaz made a campaign promise that I intend to hold him to. You what, uh, bribe them? I've been known to make the occasional charitable contribution. In exchange, my back is scratched by the good men in blue. Yours not so much. You blew a point one two. I what? Blood alcohol content. Next time, call a cab. Are you out of your mind? I've been sober for 12 years. Which is what makes your relapse that much more tragic. The president can't have a dipsomaniac serving as legal counsel. Happily, there is a way to avoid the drunk tank. The inauguration is in two weeks. How the hell do you expect me to get you a private meeting? I have no idea. Let's hope you're smarter than everyone says you are, Marlon. Marlon, that's not a very common name. I knew a Marlon when I was young. Marlon Trout. One boy, two fish names. Funny. Set the meeting, Marlon. Which was your favorite? If you love a good bowl of soup, vote Red Cheese. 
Or if you think two fish names are funny, vote Red Trout. Marlon Trout. That's funny. It was funny. Okay. (laughs) Well, let's see uh, what all of you special agents thought of the return of the blacklist. Uh, Stephen said, or Stefan. Oh, I'm sorry, Stefan. But you know, it, it, your parents probably meant Stephen. <laughs> so Stefan, <laughs> uh, didn't leave me with any deeper imprints. I don't want to be too negative out of respect for those that still enjoy the show. It just feels like something is missing and I cannot put my finger on it. Too many kidnappings, too much baby screen time, absence of those oddball villains. I do wish we had some more oddball villains. Uh, so, so do I. And I think I think now that we're over the Alexander Kirk uh, arc, I think we're probably going to get them. Yeah, especially if we have Mulder and Scully back. We can totally go back to X-Files now. Yeah, I mean, at least scattered throughout. Have some more of those with the mythology tossed in. Exactly. Uh, Crystal said, I thought the episode was good. I thought it was a good jumping off point for the second half. In order to make Liz an agent again, I guess they had to spend an episode to do that. So now we can get back to business. The highlights for me, Liz's video diary at the beginning was cute. Red's lady folding laundry was fantastic. I thought that the conversation was so funny. Loved Aram's list of ladies, hashtag Aram Dorable. <laughs> and the badass Samar's line, I'm good, was awesome. The downside for me, not nearly enough Dembe. Cooper being upset about Kirk seemed in character, but his displeasure with Red over Liz seemed uh, to come a bit at a weird time. I love Aram, had his strong moment with Samar, but now it's Aram that says no, and Samar is interested. Mm-hmm. Yep. I like that, actually. I thought that was my favorite part of the show. It was. Show. But, uh, Mar- Maricelli? Maricel? I, one of those. Wasn't crazy about this episode. I like the idea of an episode that focused more on Aram and Navabi, but the execution of that wasn't very exciting. I am, however, greatly pleased at the return of Agent Elizabeth Keene. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say, look, I, I know most people don't want to watch this again, but I would say I legitimately just thought it was meh the first time I watched it. The episode got exponentially better the second time. So I would suggest if you're a big fan of The Blacklist, which I assume if you're listening to this, you are, give it another go. You might like it a little more. I, I think there is a lot of setting up pieces in this episode so the actual crux of the story kind of gets lost in the chaos for a little while but the second time it it was a lot smoother for me it was it was for me as well uh anita this was a slow episode it needed more red in it i know they were laying some background but it would be nice if they could do it in a more exciting way that said samar needs to run from aram any guy who tells you he can't accept a major part of you the way you are is someone who needs to stay in the friend zone Interesting twist on our, our relationship. Oh. Yeah, uh, he is not a potential life partner. Samar has always been a badass and will be unable to permanently change that part of herself. How do you? Feel, uh, that's actually a really good point. How do you feel about that? I, I, I totally get where Anita's coming from. I mean, we always say you are who you are and people should accept you for who you are and you shouldn't change for anybody. So from that perspective, I totally understand and get it. Um, I think that there is a a stance of Samar's personality that could bend a little bit um, as she tries to understand why, because it's, it's not about, Oh, you're trying to change me and it becomes a personal thing. It's all about me. That's not what it's really about. It's about being a partner and being there that when you have your faults, the other person holds up your faults and brings up your faults and tries to fix, you know, not fix those, but you know, compensate for those. And you would do the same, right? That's the whole part about being in a relationship. So I think in this case, if Samar and Aram were to get together, I think the things that Aram is kind of like eh, about Samar, Samar probably like her has, being treasonous <laughs> could be one of them. Uh, yeah. So, you know, Aram could probably have those same things. So together they might be able to work that out. I don't think it's really, you know, you have to change to be with Aram. I don't think that's the case. I think it's more of, you know, we have to work on it together if we want the relationship to work. Yeah. I, I am of the mindset that, I agree with you, Anita. You shouldn't have to change who you are fundamentally as a person uh, because of a relationship, because that generally means it's a bad relationship. But I will take a nod to Mr. Jack Nicholson and as good as it gets, because to me, the sign of of, of the right one or someone you should focus your time on is someone that makes you want to be a better person. You choose to be a better person. 
And that's what I think. You know, I want to be a better man is what he says in that movie. Or you make me want to be a better man. And I think that's what it is. I think uh, I think Samar sees Aram as he is a good person. I want to be a better person. I want to be different than what I am now. She's choosing to make a change. I don't think that's the same thing as you have to change to be with me. It's I've already accepted that I can't be with you because I, I do not like the person you are currently. And she decides, you know what? He's right. I need to make a change. And I'm, I'm totally accepting of that. Yeah, good good analogy. Love that. That's perfect. Um, that's a great movie. Everybody should watch that. Wendy Davies. First off, welcome back, Troy and Aaron. Well, hello. Hello. How you, how you doing? Uh, on the first watch, I was wondering what John uh, Bokekamp meant by saying this episode would lead the rest of the season in another direction, but failed to see it. On second viewing, see, that's a trend. It does leave a lot of doors open for certain characters' future. Obviously, Samar, will we see her stay or go? Tom, thinking about his parentage, this leads us to think, uh, I think, to see him go over to the redemption side. You think? Uh, then there was Lizzie's surprise, back as an agent. As episodes go, it was okay-ish, in my honest opinion. Very little in the way of Red, but I love watching Spader portray Red when he speaks in that childish, talk-down, sarcastic mode. Yeah, I'm a fan of that, too. I don't know why. Love the interaction between Cooper and Red. Coop certainly had a raw nerve there, and Red took it. Those two definitely have a past, I think more so than we already know, which is exactly why Red can't be Katarina, in my opinion. Aram's disposi- uh, dis- deposition scene was cute, and here we all thought Aram was lacking on getting the girl department. He can get them. He just can't seem to keep them. He also picks people with porn addictions. That's weird. Uh, I do hope that they do not pursue the love interest between Aram and Samar. Wow, they do not? We've gone through almost four seasons with one love story already. We do not need another. I would argue this is a better love story. Yeah, I said it. Mm -hmm. Uh, My question is, why did Red pick this particular blacklister? And was he aware of Samar's involvement? (laughs) He definitely threw her ass under the bus. Usually he has something to gain from the blacklisters uh, he picks, but I can't fathom what he would gain from this one. Red's gathering of a team for the upcoming war appears to be making progress. He has the cabal and now the president-elect in his pocket. Question is, will they be able to help him or are they sitting ducks? So Lizzie is now a bona fide agent again. It'd be interesting to see if she will be a full-on agent or will opt to take a minor role, albeit with a gun, because she's a mommy now. Wonder where her priorities will lie when push comes to shove. Yeah. Uh, I th- I th- I'm going to say real quick, I think um, because of Megan's stance on motherhood, I really think they're going to make sure that she is a full-fledged agent because, you know, you can be and still be a mother. Absolutely, 100%. Um, we, I, we didn't really talk about it, but Lipid Seafood Company as the blacklister name. I, I was trying to figure out as I watched this the second time, what is the, what does Red get out of it part of this story? I mean, is it the fact that he gets Agent Keen back to agent status, which will allow him to do bigger and better things to advance his empire? Yeah, but they didn't have anything to do with the, the Lipid seafood, seafood Company. company. Exactly. Yeah. So what was it about the seafood company that was the thing that made it a blacklister versus, say, Farouk? As the blacklist, we kind of had the same thing when we had, uh, oh, what was it? The uh, the assassin guy, the uh, the dark web, uh, Ariat Kane, was it right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, where it didn't seem like Red knew who it was. So why is that a blacklister? So like, it throws the whole what is the blacklist question again up in the air of why is the seafood company on the blacklist specifically? Maybe it pertains to that uh, Amtar Hamida project that was referenced. It could in- be. Yeah, maybe that's why. I, I I don't know. Maybe we'll find out later. But I agree. It as the as of this episode, it doesn't make sense. The dog thing. The brr. <laughs> <laughs> that your impression of a dog? Exactly. Ruh row, ruh row, Reggie. Uh, Rachel said, finishing up here, watching it again. It is a trend. Uh, three points makes a trend. Uh, it, it's actually a pretty good episode. Uh, Red and Wendy, the human divining rod, and the laundry was hilarious. I loved all the wrestler action. Navabi yeah. crossing over to Masad. Uh, it was all sulky, Daddy Gate. It wasn't. 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 Wasn't, wasn't all yeah. sulky, Daddy Gate, or all about Liz and no one else. Uh, Redding, Redding him back to his old humorous self. I liked it. Yeah, I liked it. I didn't. I still didn't love it or anything else. I liked it, which is fine. Yeah, it wasn't like the gin where you're like, whoa, what did I just watch? But I mean, you're, Are you going to reference that episode? That episode is single... fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that episode was like wow never saw any of that coming that is we know, a great piece of TV. you know how i you know how i already know that because you mentioned it at least 15 times the gin the gin the gin 
Okay, now we're at 18. A quick thank you to all the way from Ireland. It is Deidre, uh, who was nice enough to leave us an iTunes review. It says, best blacklist podcast. I love this podcast. If you want to delve into the mythology of the show and immerse yourself in all aspects of its creation and production, then Troy and Aaron are the guys for you. They're also incredibly witty, too. I assume she's referring to me. Definitely. Remember, you can leave your review if you're enjoying the show by heading over to goldenspiralmedia.com slash iTunes, click on our podcast for the blacklist, and leave your thoughts for us, please. It really does help the podcast. Troy? It's good to be I back. I want to say. Good to yeah. be back. How, how do you feel being back at the uh, blacklist exposed now? I tell you, it's a lot uh, easier than Westworld, that's for sure. <laughs> Man, we had a we had a fun time doing the uh, the Beyond Westworld podcast. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out, please do. Uh, if you haven't seen Westworld, please watch it. Uh, maybe during the Blacklist hiatus, it's only ten episodes, or you can do it in a weekend. Uh, it was a fantastic, fantastic show, and uh, we had fun doing that as a little mini project during the break. It didn't feel so mini, man. Oh my it, gosh, no! That that show was a lot of work. A lot of work. <laughs> a lot of work. A lot of thinking. I don't like my brain hurting that much. Not to say that we don't do uh, a lot of work for this show too. We do do a lot of work for this show as well. But that was, it was, it was a quick turnaround to get that podcast out in in twenty four hours. <laughs> I don't want. I don't ever want to do that again. Never. Uh, I, I hope they do. Maybe they can air that on Thursdays when it comes back. That would be great <laughs> in twenty eighteen or something. I do. I do want to say now that we've actually reached the end of the blacklist episode because there are a lot of people that listen uh, for us. What did you have a good holiday? I absolutely had a fantastic holiday. Uh, the Packers ran the table. Uh, I'm a Green Bay Packers fan, so to get into the playoffs, win the NFC North, that was a really great holiday birthday present. Um, I, I did have a, a significant milestone birthday over the holiday, so that's good. How was that? Uh, the big four, the twenty one, maybe twenty one, twenty one again. Yes, God, for like the nineteenth time. Good job. The good thing is I saw Kung Fu Panda three last year, so I know that rolling downhill is actually more fun. So that's a good thing. Um, and then, I don't get that joke because I didn't see the movie. Oh, it's a good movie. You should watch it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's on my list. Holiday. <laughs> I got kids, man. Got the kids. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, no, it was a great, great holiday. Uh, weather was pretty decent. Uh, had some snow in December up here in the Chicagoland area, so that was good. Uh, watched um, some really great television uh, over the break. I uh, saw Travelers on Netflix, which was really good. I saw this really great docudrama from Nat Geo on uh, the TV show Mars. It was really fantastic. I mm -hmm. highly suggest you check it out. Uh, caught up on Timeless from our good friends at Sony. Uh, That's actually really good. It's that really movie, good, yeah. Isn't there a... There's a Golden Spiral Media podcast covering that, There too, is, I yes. Uh, check it out. Re, uh, Remaking History is the Golden Spiral Media podcast. They really do a good job talking about... Uh, it, they basically go back in time to specific certain historical events. So mm -hmm. on the podcast, they go into that historical event uh, from a true history knowledge perspective, not the TV version of it. Um, but yeah, it, it's really, really a great show. Uh, Doug and Karen do that one. So check that out at Remaking History over at uh, goldenspiralmedia.com. But yeah, it's a, it's a great show. I, only reason I didn't watch it live was Westworld, but like literally took up all of our time. <laughs> yeah, it's all it's all on Hulu, though. So I've actually been catching up on that. Exactly. Myself. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that show. It's 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 an interesting concept. And I tell you, the 1199 Hulu plan, no commercials worth it that's what i pay man worth oh it's it. golden love it worth if only it. blacklist was still on it i know that would be, that would be fantastic, fantastic. Ugh. Ugh. you owe me a coke jinx <laughs> so that's uh you sound like you had a good holiday yeah it was a, it was a good two weeks off so looking forward to uh, getting back in the saddle here and talking some uh, red reddington because i think it's going to be a, an interesting six weeks from here leading up to the spinoff uh, and, I, and I, I've heard nothing but good things of the spinoff so far from, you know, chatter and things I've seen on the interwebs. Uh, but yeah, it's it's going to be interesting, I think. Well, since you didn't ask, uh, my holiday was nice, too. I just Thanks. I just assumed you were going to jump in with your with your thesis after I was done. No, no, I was, you, you know, I was, all, I was all about you and apparently you just don't care. So it's fine. Well, it was my birthday. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How was your holiday, Aaron? Like anybody cares. Uh, it was it was really good. It was really enjoyable. I didn't. I watched a lot of movies because the Hollywood Outsider and my other podcast. We had to do like our, our year end wrap up kind of thing. So I was catching up on a lot of that. Tons of movies, man. I saw a lot of really cool ones. The Autopsy of Jane Doe is a little independent film. I hope people watch. Um, there, I saw Hidden Figures just recently, which actually ties into Timeless because it, Catherine Johnson is actually a character in one of the episodes. Oh yeah, yeah. Really good movie. Cos sure Cosner's in that one, right? Costner's in that one. Yeah. yeah. Costner's in that one. 
A lot, a lot of good quality films. I really watched a ton of Leverage <laughs> on Netflix, which if you've never watched Leverage, if you're looking for a fun, light, airy show, my God, that show is so fun. Parker just makes me smile from ear to ear. This is the second time through for you or the first time? I think it's like the third or fourth time. Oh, gosh, yeah. You, yeah, I've seen that show before. You, and it you was, should be married was, to my wife. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I went and saw Hidden Figures after I went on my Leverage binge, and uh, Hardison's actually in... Uh, Aldous Hodge is actually in oh, really? figures. Oh, nice. Yeah, and he actually has a, a dramatic role. He's really good in it. But every time he was talking, I'm like, man, make, make some jokes. Come mm-hmm. on, man, make some jokes. Hack something. Yeah, right. So that was that was pretty interesting. And I do want to mention, uh, Troy got me a really cool, if you ever listen to Remake This Movie Right, uh, which Troy and I do, Clue was one of my favorite movies. We actually did an episode devoted to Clue. It's one of my all-time favorite movies. Love it. The, it's such a brilliant comedic classic and underrated in almost every way and tim curry is just just genius in it and troy actually found me the original poster of clue and had it framed for me for christmas and it's on my wall and it is a glorious thing of monumental glory i don't know what i want to say but it's beautiful is what i'm saying see so for all of you that say we hate each other there's still a little bit of a a small heart in there gift out of it all that hate brought me a gift. Yep, yep. I felt bad so, for yeah, him for yeah. losing the mother theory debate. <laughs> so many people. Man, there were so many. We didn't even talk about that. I know we got to wrap the show up, but I figured we were done with the blacklist stuff. And some sure, people sure. have asked us to tell us about you know our holidays. So just, you know, you can always shut it off. You don't care. But we got so much email about that episode. Our episode, not the actual show. Our episode. Yeah, well, uh, last I checked, it was debate. like 200 comments on Facebook and the group. It was like, wow. Yeah, plus the emails and everything else. I mean, it's just a lot of row <laughs> <laughs> at Troy and row at me for discounting Troy. I mean, it depends on which which side you're on. But I also think he converted a few people. I, I have an army brewing. It, it does yeah, seem like that. Um, the were, lack of common sense army. Yep, Good for them. They work at TV Guide. Too. They should put together an organization on TV Guide. <laughs> no, I, th- I thought it was great that you were starting to like uh, amass this this group of uh, people that were defending you and and uh, going after me and telling me you stop picking on Troy. I'm like, what? When, when did this happen? When did he become a victim? Yeah, and after TV uh, Guide posted the article and Cinema Blend and a few others, uh, John still hasn't picked up the phone to call me. So just uh, putting that out there. Yeah. Thanks, John. Thanks for not stomping that theory into the ground, which makes it more plausible, not less. So thanks for that. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, that's it. I think we just wanted to catch up on what we were doing for those that were asking. So there you go. Sure, sure. Uh, not, nothing too exciting. I did have 11 days off where no podcasts were done. Just enjoyed my life. And it was great. I know now why people like being lazy. That's for sure. That's so good. So that's going to conclude this episode. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at the Blacklist GSM, where we live tweet during the East Coast feed, and we use the show's hashtag the Blacklist. Don't forget to follow us on Tumblr, Instagram, and also join the Facebook group. Just search for the Blacklist Exposed. Talk about the show, the podcast, or what your favorite sushi roll might be. <laughs> you can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or listen from the website. But if you are really on the go, make sure you download our app for iOS and Android, powered by Spreaker. You will also find all the intel and analysis about this episode for Lipid Seafood Company by visiting theblacklistexposed.com. Big thanks for listening, guys. Don't forget to answer our profiling question, which is, how will Liz thank Red for the pardon? And I'm going to throw this back at you. Bow, chicka, bow, bow. <laughs> the shippers will rejoice for giving them a door. See you nah, next just, week. <laughs> just throwing it for them. There you go. All right. Have a good one, guys. Until next time, I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit, well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie right. We are available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on Twitter at H underscore Outsider. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The The Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts.